Hey, <laughs> we got here at, at last. <laughs> what a what a day! What a day! Um, you know, but yeah, we got here. This is this is fantastic. It's good to have you, Monwara. Um, you know, talking about rebirth, starting this rebirth series, and the reason why I started this rebirth series is that I I. I, I I, I, I understand the importance of understanding seasons, to be self-aware and to understand what is going on in this time. You know, there's a time for every, everything. There's a time to laugh, there's a time to cry, and there's a time to be still, and there's, there's a time to move, make movement. And having that awareness and having that understanding is so critical and so important um, in terms of our personal development, our spiritual development, and our growth as an individual. So for me, um, what happened to me prior to uh, um, my, uh, um, my pregnancy loss experience was that I was basically, I felt my life was stagnant and I was just coasting, you know, I wasn't really sure what direction I needed to go into and I was just coasting, but I knew I needed something, something needed to shake me up. I didn't want this to be the thing that shook me, right? But what I found is when I got into that experience, there was a lot of things that happened. I felt that, you know, I felt like my eyes were opened. It was. I felt like there was a there was an urgency to not make excuses anymore, right? There was an urgency that I needed to now take action, right? It, it, it might be small actions, it might be big actions, but I needed to, to take action. So I felt like I always say the person I was before then and the person that I am now are two totally, totally different individuals. So I wanted to talk about rebirth, and I think the whole concept of rebirth is different for many, many individuals. And I just wanted to get your perspective on it and to share your own personal and professional experience in terms of coming through and, you know, like the butterfly <laughs> experience. Over to you. Thank you, KG. That's uh, really helpful. Like to see it from your perspective and understand that sometimes those big things are there that make us stop and question and in some ways understand and realize our self-worth. Mm. And so for me, it's happened so many times, personally and professionally. Um, I, I would say that the time where I ended up not having a roof over my head and in temporary accommodation was the time, one of the times when I kind of came out of that situation when I was heavily pregnant and felt that for me to have a life that is very different to the life I grew up knowing, where everything around me was about deprivation, you know, not no proper housing, no proper jobs, not having the best things to wear, not being able to, um, you know, eat the best things, made me realize that for me to change that I have to work really hard. And mm. that suddenly I had this feeling that, and it was after I was put in that situation where I was, I guess everything was quite bleak. I, I was expecting to end up in temporary accommodation for, for nine to 12 months. And within two and a half weeks, when we got a flat uh, offer, uh, that was the moment when I, I guess for me, that was a big rebirth because I decided mm. I am not going to be like that. You know, my mm. life is not going to be like that. I am going to work really hard. And having put a law degree under my belt, mm. even then I didn't have that feeling. 
when when I decided I was going to pursue law, it was for the same reason. Yet mm -hmm. I always worked hard, and there were times where I felt like I was walking away, giving up on that dream. Mm -hmm. But then it wasn't until when I found myself homeless, if you like, in temporary accommodation. Um, didn't know how long I was going to be there, heavily pregnant, worried, scared that I'm going to give birth to my baby here. That mm -hmm. is the moment when I made that, I think, for me, that big decision. And there was that rebirth where I said, mm -hmm. I don't care how hard I work. And in mm -hmm. fact, <laughs> I remember when the baby was little and I used to work for the public sector. So I used to work in a local authority in London. Mm. and I, as I worked there for nearly 10 years but um, I would start work eight o'clock in the morning and go to my next job at 5 p.m and finish there at 10 o'clock wow. and I did that and I nearly for six months I did that but we saved enough money to pay for a deposit for a house mm. you know mm. so so for me that was a rebirth but I do believe that there are many moments of rebirth Yes. Major things do happen in, throughout our lives where, you know, um, you kind of rethink. And, and again, another example would be the 2020 pandemic for me. Mm. I would say up until then, I used to feel humility meant a woman should use her privilege and her ability to give someone else a platform. Right. But in 2020, I realized if we do that, then how do we fill the gap that has always been there growing up? I never saw anyone like myself on a mm. platform KG. Mm. So I thought, okay, so most of my life I'm waiting around for other people mm. to lead. Mm. So if I lack a role model, then that means lots of people, women like me, lack role models. That means I have to be uncomfortable and put myself out there. Hmm. There were those questions, uh, I think anybody would rethink, what is my employer going to say? What are other people going to think? But, you know, I've never really been, what can I say? That's never been a barrier for me. My barriers have been internal. My barriers have always been me feeling that perhaps I'm not good enough because I came from that council estate, because I didn't get a first class law degree, um, because I didn't become, you know, the best criminal lawyer around. Um, all of those things. So I guess I changed all of that because I decided that I have a social responsibility to make sure that other women like me see me as a role model. Mm. So that was a rebirth for me mm. in the sense that in April 2020, I became very ill. And I don't know till this day whether it was COVID. And I found myself in a lot of pain I had to call an ambulance. The pain was uh, on my neck, my back, my shoulder, both my arms. I couldn't move my fingertips even. And I think it must probably be the closest I've ever come to burnout. That's when I decided I stopped and I suddenly, I stopped doing because that forced me to stop. Yeah. And I started listening. That's when I realized, oh, but my team want me to do things. They don't want me to work so hard at work. They want to help me. They want to take more away from me. And actually, am I making them redundant? Mm. You know, am I, what is it that I am doing? Because, you know, self-awareness, KG, I firmly believe is not, just about knowing who we are. Mm. It's about reminding ourselves often, how mm. are others viewing us? Because mm. I think we often forget that. Mm. Mm. 
right? Mm. So that was another rebirth moment for me. And I think I kind of morphed into something else. I mm. started to leverage my own strength as a woman, as a female who has succeeded in so many ways that yes. other women in my situation wouldn't have. I decided I'm going to utilize all of that to be more visible, Mm. and to make sure I am a representation of Asian Muslim women. Yes, and you're doing that perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm doing yeah. my best. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing that perfectly. And I think that, you know, you know, following your journey on even on LinkedIn and every single day and you post and those posts are quite they resonate with a lot of people. And for me, it's, it's the permission we give ourselves to show up as ourselves every single day, regardless of the internal negative talk. Because let's be honest, everyone has those talk, even the, what, the individuals that seem so confident and they've got it all together. We all have that talk, but it's the permission to say, even though, I don't feel 100%. I choose to show up, you know. I choose to, you know, show who I am and not be afraid. And I think that when we talk about, you know, the aspect of fear sometimes that we have of actually showing up, what are the things that you have done to, to overcome those challenges? I guess first and foremost, I remind myself where I have succeeded very well is being a self-champion. And I think in the leadership journey, uh, just succeeding as a self-champion, tapping into your own self-belief, your faith and your trust is very much connected to then being able to, I guess, on the journey, bringing other people on it because mm. you cannot succeed uh, as a leader if you are capable the your next challenge is to make other people capable mm. but how can you make others capable mm. so there lies the challenge mm. if 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 i trust myself i know what i am capable of doing so it's no longer a challenge for me about what I can do and how far I can go in terms of a particular activity or a delivery of a project. It's more about how can I transform somebody who comes to me mm. and is a stage A or one, how can I help them get to stage three? Because surely I've used tools that have worked for me. And I always tap in because most people will have a problem with trust and that's why they struggle to collaborate. Mm. Most people will have a, a problem because also that they've had lots of experiences where their trust has been broken. That's part and parcel of life, but it's bouncing back, you know, coming back from that situation and trusting yourself Ourself and internally, for and foremost, is everything. How did I know in 2014 when I said I'm going to help revive a festival which was very popular in the 90s? Mm. It shut down in 2000. And in 2014, I spent, actually it was November 2013, I spoke to lots of local businesses and I decided I'm going to help revive this festival. How did I know? Oh my gosh, KG, it was a mammoth task. I was scared. I was truly scared. But I kept saying to myself, yeah, but I was 20 and I traveled to America and I didn't know anyone. And I, I shook hands with prisoners on death row and, you know, and I lived on my own and I had very little money and I coped and I survived. I'll, I'll do this as well. Mm. You know, it's it's being able to and at that stage I really was passionate about one thing I made very clear to everybody at the time was 
the why. Why do we want to revive the Wolfenstow Village Festival? Mm. I mean, that was something I did in my role, uh, uh, my job at Wolf and Forest Community Hub, where I'm a chief exec at the moment. So I had people telling me what I should be doing. I could see the doubts. I could see the lack of trust. There was a lot of condescending behavior around me. Mm. And yet deep down inside, it's almost like, you know, in a way you have to come outside yourself. Mm. There's a little girl inside you, mm. you know, and you become that protector and you think, and you, you're constantly motivating that little girl inside you saying, you'll be all right. Cause mm. you've done this before. You've done this before you can do it again. And I guess as a leader, as you grow, you also realize that you need to expand that with people around you, your support network. You know, when I was heavily pregnant and homeless, I didn't really have a support network, but I survived because I tapped inside, right? But uh, I couldn't have achieved the Wolfenstow Village Festival, which attracted 3000 people on one day had I not had the support of the people around me. So I guess in our leadership journey, no matter how better we get at tapping into our inner you know, uh, self-belief and faith and trust in ourselves, we need to then be able to emulate that outward. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and, and you do that by um, articulating your vision. Yes. And then it's your passion that people fall in love with. Yes. Yes. So, so yeah, I, I just had to share that example of when I was, you know, working at the community hub and the village festival, because that was very much professional. And at the time I got the um, leaders um, award from the local authority in recognition of that job. But, you know, I had so much support from local councillors and local mm. residents. Yes. Yeah. And, and that just shows that it takes a village. <laughs> it takes Absolutely. a village. It takes a village. If you want to get to the next level, it takes a village to get to that next level. And, you know, feeling the fear and still going ahead and doing it. Yes. You yes. know, um, and that brings me to so inspire CIC and what you're doing for that community and how you are in a way giving those women another chance. Um, hope, mm. I think is part of rebirth as well. To have the hope to know that I, I, don't, I don't have to be, I don't, I'm not, um, what's the word? I am not um, tied to this position. I can move forward and giving those women those opportunities, I think that is incredible. And I just want you to tell me a little bit about that. What inspired that? What's behind that? Okay, so it probably goes down my why, back to my why. Uh, yeah. I guess my uh, reason has always been, I believe that women have the ability and the power inside them to be leaders. But if they don't get the right support at the right time, you know, there's a lot of uh, people that really struggle. So my mother never really had much support when she was struggling with her own mental health when mm. I was growing up. Mm. And seeing that firsthand made me realize how and why women suffer so much. Mm. Um, I think women's mental health Men's mental health is just as, um, you know, an important, important need that needs to be addressed. But in countries like Bangladesh, where I was born, women are extremely vulnerable. You know, they don't get jobs. Um, a, a lot of young girls don't go as far as get as far as um, secondary education. They barely finish primary education and parents will have them married off really young. Mm. So my friend Parvin, who's one of the founding members of Stow Inspire, um, she had this idea to build homes for widows and divorcees. Mm. 
Mm. So between us, we went to Bangladesh in November and we have been doing it since two, 2017, but we raised money to turn. So most of these women live in shelters that are like really makeshift and can't weather most uh, types of adverse weather conditions. So we uh, turned their shelters into homes. Now, me being me, I believe I'm on a journey on this earth. And my journey is never going to stop until mm. until I, the fat lady, sing in my grave. <laughs> so so recently, I developed a team of young women who we are calling the Young Inspirers. And in fact, this weekend, I will be going live with them. Oh, fantastic. So, so this is a new team that I've created. And... You know what, KG? When you know what you are capable of, you know how to also show people the light at the end of the tunnel. All mm. I did was gave them some information about the two, three houses we want to build if we can raise £3,000 this year. And within minutes, all seven girls signed up. And I said to them, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to be your mentor. And I'm going to give you all the tools and the guidance that you need to deliver this project. You need to organize a women only event. And I've got a budget for you. This is the budget. Guess who's going to make the decisions? You are. Right? I will be your sounding board, but you will make the decisions. Because I do run uh, the Trailblazing Leadership Program, KG, and that's only for specific types of women but I also feel a responsibility to build the capacity of the next generation you know mm -hmm. these are all Asian girls one of them mm -hmm. is my daughter and then mm -hmm. six other girls and most of them said the reason their reason for why they want to do it is one because other women will have fun right another one said uh, two of majority of them said because uh, we want to help vulnerable women. Mm. Um, somebody else said, I want to make a difference. Mm. You know, it was really, really interesting catch it, ca catching this feedback at the early stage. So it'd be interesting to see what happens at the end. And of course, this could develop into a regular program for me in the future that I would love to connect with universities and colleges and put these programs, get young women through these programs and make them believe, yes, we can do it, it's possible. So that's the whole point, you know, you give people the power and see what the possibilities are. I think this is the problem at the moment because leadership is not changing because we are not giving, we're not handing over the power. Mm. So, so that's the Stow Inspire um, project. Uh, the leadership program is very much something that I am passionate about that I do. But the Stow Inspire um, project is about turning shelters into homes. So what's happened is the two are being combined. So there'll be a group of young women that at the end of the process will receive recognition, they will receive certificates and they will get references for their university applications. The youngest, by the way, is 14 and the eldest is 18. Fantastic. That is so that is so commendable. Thank building you. the building the next generation of leaders. Um, yeah. And also that kind of ties in into the women in leadership event that is coming up soon. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? 7th of May. 7th of May. Yeah, so we've, you know, we talk about having your own, tapping into your own self-champion, but at the same time, to grow bigger and to go further, we need a mm. support network. Mm. So the Women in Leadership series came about because there is an existing group of women that have similar vision and a similar aim. And what we want to do is create a global support network where women leaders like us can support each other. Mm. It doesn't always have to be about paying for a mentoring um, you know, program or a, a coaching program, but 
if you are part of a support network where you feel a sense of belonging, mm -hmm. it certainly gives you the courage and the hope that you can grow as well. And it's a continual growth circle cycle then, isn't it? Mm. Definitely, it is a continue, and that's and that's what I wanted to bring out of of the whole series is that we grow in stages. We grow. Um, it's not a one one life event, you know. It's a continuous every single day of shedding stuff, you know, of shedding, you know, the old mindset of shedding the whole ways of thinking of shedding our own perception of ourselves of lack of um, confidence and low self-worth and all those past um, uh, past experiences that we've had that's now uh, maybe held us captive in today you know and how do we then begin to let go of those things and surrender and, and see our, ourselves grow into the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful individuals that, that we are. You know, one of the things that happened to me that was so, that was, that really changed my perspective in life. You know, I'm a person of faith. Um, and so um, there was particular teachings that, you know, were taught that, I've, I understand now that they're, they're quite faulty, but the, something happened to me in, in, in that experience of loss and grief that allowed me to see every single thing as beautiful, right? I saw God in everything, everything. It didn't matter what color you were. It didn't matter whether you're a flower, you're a butterfly. I saw his presence in everything. And because I saw his presence in everything, the way I treated and I, I was related to people was I honored them. Because you know what? You came here on a journey, right? We're all here on a journey and I honor the light that you carry. Yes. And therefore, you know, it, it's given me a different perspective on how I, I do things. And so, I mean, I thank you for coming on my, to being the first person on my Rebirth series. And I, you know, I look forward to having more guests on, on here and really just to encourage us because the world is going through many, many changes in different um, countries, Turkey at the moment, the experiences, this is the tragedy that's happened there, the different things happening into in, in the world today. And, we, and it's just um, focusing on how we can continue to create a world that is that we want to live in. And so thank you. Thank you, KG. Um, how do you stop it? Do you want to stop it for me? <laughs>